Um, thank you for joining us for another week of Grand Rounds. I know everybody's been pretty busy. So thank you for taking the time out to join us. Uh, today we have as our speaker Dr. Fani Mufidi. Uh, she recently joined us this year in our division of hospital medicine, and we've been very happy to have her here. Um, so she will be here to present. Uh, some updates and awful medicine for us. So, thank you, Dr. Woo! Hello. I think I know most of you. <laughs> <laughs> so, for those who don't know me or like to pronounce my name wrong, it's Shravni. <laughs> it's not Shravani. So, <laughs> this is the, probably the last time I'm going to tell you guys. Did <laughs> I, I say it right? Oh my God, I say it. No, you didn't. <laughs> oh, I did it? No. Damn it. Did I say your last name right? Yeah, last name right. Just say your whole name again. Shravni Reddy Mukidi. Yeah. All right. So I have a few things to talk about today. Hopefully, um, I have quite a few slides. So and we started late. I'm trying. I'll try to go as fast as possible. So don't ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it's okay. You can ask questions. So uh, the first thing that I'm talking about is uh, beta blockers in uh, cirrhosis. So now the non-selective beta blockers have been uh, used since a very long time in cirrhosis to basically decrease portal hypertension. Um, but uh, they also uh, so decrease portal hypertension, then they uh, prevent uh, variceal bleed and re-bleeding. So it's actually like called like the aspirin of uh, hepatologists because they use it so widely. Um, and uh, studies have shown that uh, you know it prevents variceal hemorrhages. It, uh, pre uh, it decreases the risk of developing uh, SITs, refractory SITs, and hepatorenal syndrome. But these studies have always been done on patients who were like compensated uh, cirrhotics. Um, and it also has been shown to like uh, decrease the incidence of like uh, uh, SPP, but it's not, the mechanism is a little different. It's not like decreasing the portal pressures, but it actually uh, decreases the intestinal permeability. And then uh, that prevents uh, SPP from happening. So these are all the benefits of, uh, um, of uh, non-selective beta blockers. So, but then of late, there have been like studies and uh, theories that the non-selective beta blockers are not, um, not very beneficial when it comes to like a decompensated patient. So um, they have, uh, they've been, uh, um, like there are a couple of studies that I don't think you can see uh, below there, but uh, they uh, hypothesized a window a hypothesis that says that there's only a window where you can use the non-selective beta blockers. So once they start decompens decompensating, uh, the non-selective beta blockers are actually not beneficial. So this is just a hypothesis. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, the study that I'm talking about, is trying to prove that this is the case. Um, so the aim of the study is to assess the influence of uh, beta blocker treatment on SVP's incidence and also the impact of the SVP development on the effect of the beta blocker treatment on the hospitalization and transplant free, free sur survival of the patients. So uh, this study was a retrospective study. It had 607 uh, patients with cirrhosis. This was done in the Medical University of Vienna from 2006 to 2011. Uh, Cox models were calculated to investigate the effect of uh, the beta blockers on transplant-free survival time as well, and uh, also adjusted for the child two stage and presence of varices. So what they found was that uh, the non-selective beta blockers, they increased the transplant-free survival uh, in patients without SPP, and that had a good p-value. And uh, it also reduced the uh, days of non-elective non hospitalization. So uh, patients who were on uh, non-selective beta blockers, the average was 19.4 days per year, whereas pe uh, patients who were not on non-selective beta blockers, their uh, average hospitalization was 23.9 days. So this was, this was all on patients who did not have SVP. So it showed that... Uh, the beta blockers are helpful in patients who did not develop SPP. So when they when they compared uh, the beta blockers on uh, the hemodynamics of the patients, so they had like two sets of patients. One one set was uh, where they did paracentesis for the first time. And the second set was when they diagnosed uh, the SPP. So if you see here, the this one, and this one, uh, where 
were uh, just the first pair of set pieces that was done. They didn't have SVP. Whereas these, they developed SVP. So, the, so there's no actual difference between the patients uh, who were on beta blockers or, uh, um, or were not based on the, the systolic pressure and the map. So the hemodynamics wasn't really uh, too much of a difference between the two groups. But then if you look at the p-value, it's pretty high. So I don't know if it's, it's probably is not statistically significant. But if you look at the other group where uh, they developed the SVP, so the uh, mean, arterial, mean arterial pressure and the uh, systolic pressures were uh, lower in the beta blocker groups as compared to the low beta blocker groups. So it seems like the beta blockers were uh, were uh, detrimental when it came to patients who had SVP. Uh, and then uh, the other thing that they found was that the non-selective beta blockers um, also reduced the transplant-free survival rate in patients who had SVP. So if you look at the graph, the ones with the non-selective beta blockers, the survival rate was uh, lower as compared to the ones with uh, once who were taking, once we're not taking the beta blockers. So, and also they found that the hepatorenal syndrome and uh, AKI were, uh, uh, the incidence of uh, those conditions were higher in patients who were taking beta blockers as compared to patients who were not taking beta blockers. And this was in the SVP group. Um, so the conclusion of this study was that if a patient has cirrhosis and they develop SVP, then the patient should not be on uh, non selective beta blockers. Yes. So, the beta blockers at the time of the SVP or like prior to it? They were on prior to it. Yes. So, I mean, I guess the question is if a patient has cirrhosis, if you don't know if they're going to get SVP, or you know what I mean? Like, if yeah, so you put them on S you put them on beta blockers, but once they develop SVP, then that means that the therapeutic window is almost gone, and then you might have to stop the uh, beta blockers because if you keep continuing, then their uh, blood pressures are going to go down, and then they might develop uh, uh, hepatorenal syndrome and AKI. And so yeah, the other thing I would wonder is like if this is a retrospective study, and people not on beta blockers might either have a concentration like lower blood pressure. Makes them sicker, or they were less likely to care, and therefore they didn't get the appropriate care. So, and in both those cases, they didn't accept anything worse. So, um, that was one of the uh, the negative things about the study because it was a retrospective, and it's not like a prospective study where uh, you know you can follow the patients properly. And this was all based on whatever records they had. So, so that's one of the uh, things about the study. But this is like one of the first studies that was done in a, such a large scale. But uh, there have been a few more studies later um, that said it's, this is not really the case. But we don't really know why, if we should stop the beta blockers for like a short duration till they recover and then start. So that's why like more prospective studies are, uh, should be done so that we know exactly what we should do with the beta blockers once they develop SVP. But then the risk is there. So once they develop SVP, if you continue on beta blockers, the risk of them developing hepatorenal syndrome or the API is there. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay. So that's, I'm going to, the next topic that I'm going to talk about is, any questions about the previous study? All right. So the next thing I'm going to start, uh, talk about the 2018 guidelines of, uh, uh, of acute ischemic stroke. So it's it's a lot. So I try to like pick and choose uh, which ones to uh, which ones will actually actually help us. So so uh, I'm not going to talk about all the guidelines. It's only the changes that have uh, been made in these uh, in the 2018 guidelines as compared to 2013. So um, uh, so the first thing is like when the hospital stroke team related guideline is like. Uh, door to needle time. Uh, they want the goal to be like within 45 minutes in more than 50% of the patients. Mm -hmm. So um, usually like when they looked at studies, they found like mm -hmm. it's about 30%. So they want it to be at least uh, 45, more than 45%. Uh, 
this is more related to like when the patient comes and the ER management, but I'll get get to where we come in and then our management as well. So, uh, and when it comes to like brain imaging, so uh, within 20 minutes is the, the, the CAT scan should be done in more than at least 50% uh, of the patients who may be candidates for uh, IV uh, alteplase or mechanical thrombectomy. And uh, on the CAT scan, the hyperdense uh, MCA sign should not be used as a criteria to withhold uh, IV alteplase from patients who might otherwise uh, benefit from it. And uh, the routine use of uh, MRI to like uh, exclude uh, cerebral microbleeds before uh, administration of IV alteplase is not recommended. And uh, the multimodal CT and MRI, including perfusion imaging, should not delay the uh, administration of uh, IV alteplase. So the blood pressure, I mean, we have the, the same guidelines that we had before are valid, but uh, the other things that have uh, changed is that hypertension and hypovolemia should be corrected to maintain systemic perfusion levels necessary to support organ function. Although this is just an expert opinion because uh, there have not really been any studies to prove this. And uh, there's not much of data um, about uh, patients who, uh, uh, in whom the intra-arterial therapy is planned and that they did not receive the IV uh, thrombolytic therapy, it is reasonable to maintain the blood pressure at less, less or equal to 185 over 110 before the procedure. The, the body temperature, like the benefits of induced hypothermia is not very well established and hypothermia should be offered only if uh, patients are in a clinical trial. Otherwise, hypothermia is not really recommended. For the IV alteplase, the eligible patients with mild stroke presenting in the three to four and a half hour window, mm -hmm. treatment with uh, IV alteplase may be reasonable, but uh, the risk should be weighed against the possible uh, benefits. And uh, for patients who have like small number of uh, cerebral microbleeds on MRI that were done before, uh, it still is reasonable to give uh, IV alteplase. And uh, patients who have like a high burden of uh, the cerebral microbleeds on an MRI, uh, the giving IV alteplase can increase or increase the risk of intracranial hemorrhage. So the benefits of the treatment is uncertain. And uh, for sickle cell patients, IV alteplase is, uh, it can be beneficial. So that's not really a contraindication. When it comes to antiplatelets, there have been a study where uh, they use like 21 days of uh, dual uh, antiplatelet therapy with uh, aspirin and Plavix. Uh, they, they started it like 24 hours uh, after, this, uh, after the stroke and uh, they, they, can, they continued it about 90 days. And it has shown to be beneficial, but this was done in China. So uh, now like multi-center uh, trials are going on all over uh, the world to see if this can be uh, this can this can work for everyone or not, or it's only for the Asian population. And uh, Brillinta is not really recommended over aspirin in the acute treatment of patients with minor strokes. So for uh, anticoagulants, the short-term anticoagulant, uh, anticoagulation for uh, non-occlusive extracranial intraluminal intra thrombus uh, is not very well established. So. In the in-hospital management of blood pressure, so the uh, early treatment of hypertension is indicated when there's like associated comorbid conditions, like if the patient has like an acute uh, coronary event, like a acute uh, heart failure, aortic dissection, intracranial hemorrhage, or preeclampsia or eclampsia. So you can lower the blood pressure by 15% is probably safe. It still is not uh, clear cut because we don't have enough studies for that. Uh, so patients uh, with blood pressure more than or equal to 220 or 120 who did not uh, receive uh, IV alteplase or uh, 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 thrombectomy, they, uh, and they don't have any comorbid conditions, uh, and they, uh, they, require the, they don't have these comorbid conditions that require blood pressure control, then uh, they can start on uh, antihypertensives usually within the 48 to 72 hours. But this is, this is still is like uncertain. There's no clear cut guidelines regarding this. And this uh, it's also reasonable to lower the blood pressure by 15% in the, in the first 24 hours. 
Um, you can also start antihypertensives in patients uh, uh, whose blood pressure is above 140 over 90, and they're, it, it's stable neurologically. And because this is shown like after discharge, then their prognosis uh, improves with their stroke. When it comes to nutrition, so enteral diet should be started within seven days of admission after an acute stroke. So um, NG tubes or uh, PEG is okay if NG tube, if you think, if you anticipate that the patient is uh, going to need uh, prolonged enteral feeding, then uh, PEG is okay. The complications with PEG is a lot more as compared to NG tube, but either this or that is recommended for, to make sure they have enteral feeding. Uh, oral hygiene is important to res reduce the risk of stroke, but it's not really like studies are not many. It's just reasonable to make sure that they have good uh, oral hygiene. So for DVD prophylaxis, the studies have shown like uh, only Intermittent pneumatic compression devices are beneficial. Um, prophylactic dose of uh, heparin is not uh, well established. And But if you have to use the prophylactic anticoagulation, um, either unfractionate heparin or uh, low, mo low molecular weight heparin is, uh, is okay. There's no difference between those two. Um, so for uh, the other imaging, the vascular imaging, so if patients are like, you think they're candidates for uh, carotid endotrectomy or stenting, then uh, you should get uh, imaging to assess uh, for any, uh, uh, for uh, non-cervical uh, vessels within 24 hours of the admission. And uh, if patients, if you think uh, the patient, uh, if, uh, if you see on a CTA or MRI, so CTA or MRI is not really recommended to see if uh, they actually have intra intracranial vasculature uh, stenosis. So you don't really have to do that. And for cardiac evaluation, um, the routine use of echo is not really recommended because it's not cost effective. So when it comes to cholesterol, so and the routine measurement of cholesterol in all patients with ischemic uh, stroke is not uh, is not recommended if they're already on uh, high high intensity statins. But unless you think that the patient might benefit with like newer uh, statin therapies, like, like uh, the proprotein convertase subtilicin kexin type nine inhibitor treatment, that's usually for outpatient. If you think uh, they might benefit because uh, they're still getting strokes even on like high high intensity statin, that that's when you can actually uh, do a uh, lipid panel. Otherwise, it's not really right. Um, so patients who qualify for statin therapy, the, you should start the uh, statins in, in hospital. And when it comes to antithrombotic therapy, patients who have uh, non-cardioembolic um, ischemic stroke while they were taking antiplatelet therapy, switching to warfarin is not beneficial for secondary stroke prevention. And uh, for patients who have ischemic stroke in the setting of uh, atrial fibrillation, it's reasonable to start uh, oral anticoagulation within four to 14 days after the onset of uh, neurological symptoms. So that's in a nutshell about the new stroke guidelines. There are a lot more, but I just picked a few. Do you have any questions? Um, it's not really, it's not really fixed, but within, like if you're giving um, IV to place, then obviously it's later, but uh, within 24 hours you can, it's, it's, you can start if it's not. So, and any other questions? If there's no indication, if you think it's like not abnormal, then you should, it's not really recommended. Well, you're always recommending it. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, lipids, are, I think that's, this is the, yeah. But if they're already on high intensity status, what are we going to do? We're going to get lipids. Uh, 
No, there was nothing mentioned. I mean, they have like a lot of contraindications. They mentioned it in the ISO guidelines, but uh, I haven't really seen any free options. Yeah, on to the like certain uh, that they don't have access to the broadcast. Oh, you mean that? Yes, yeah. uh, there are like a lot of guidelines, so they need to they need to find and then send. Otherwise, if they are not within, if they are within the window, then they need to go to the nearest uh, hospital, which can get PPA. Is that your question? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those are all the old guidelines. So I didn't really concentrate much on the EMS, the uh, and like the pre-hospital guidelines. I, I focus more on the inpatient. Is Twenty-four hours. Yeah. And um, I mean, these are all the old guidelines. There's nothing that has changed. Uh, and also, like, if if within 24 hours you don't find anything, there's no indication to do like outpatient monitoring. So just 24 hours. Okay. Um, the next is the CDF uh, guidelines. I think Harry sent that out to everybody. I don't know if you guys had a chance to read through. But uh, I can, I'll quickly go over the seat of guidelines. Um, so uh, who do you test? So patients who have like uh, newly, new onset, more than three uh, unformed stools in 24 hours is, is someone you would want to test seed of on. But it's a very weak recommendation and a low quality of uh, evidence. So you will go by whatever your, the nurses will tell you on the floor. and not to see this when they don't want you to, I guess. So, but this is what is the recommendation. Uh, repeat testing. So you don't do repeat testing uh, within seven days. So if you have a test that was negative, you don't really have to repeat it again. And and if, if they, even if they continue to have the, uh, the same diarrhea. And that's a strong recommendation. Uh, isolation, you need to continue isolation for like at least 48 hours after the diarrhea has resolved. And uh, if uh, it all depends on the hospital, if they have like a high um, seat of infection rates, then they might ask you to continue. So it, it's, it depends on, on how the rate of the CDI is. So if, uh, if they have a high CDI rate, then you might have to continue is uh, contact isolation for the whole duration of the hospitalization. Uh, PPIs and CDIs, uh, epi uh, epidemiologically, uh, they have been an association between uh, using PPIs and getting CDF. But uh, if they are unnecessarily on a PPI, you can discontinue it. But there is no uh, real evidence that suge suggests uh, that you need to discontinue PPIs uh, as to prevent uh, C uh, CDF infections. So it's not really a recommendation. It's there's no, no enough data for to give a recommendation. So the initial episode of uh, C. diff infection, so previously we used to treat with uh, flagell, meconidazole, but now uh, it's changed to either vancomycin or uh, fidoxamycin for 10 days. And uh, if in case they don't have vancomycin or fidoxamycin, then you could use uh, flagell, metronidazole, but it's the recommendation is to use vancomycin or uh, fidoxamycin. And so this is the whole table that summarizes uh, how to treat. So I already mentioned the initial episode. If it is uh, non-severe, then you can give like vancomycin or fidoxamycin, or you can alternately use uh, flagell. So if the uh, initial episode is severe, so that that's, that is, uh, the WBC count is more than 15,000, uh, or like creatinine is more than 1.5, then you have to use uh, vancomycin or fidoxamycin. And uh, for all these, the recommendations, like the strong evidence and the recommendation is high. So if the initial episode is fulminant, then you can use vancomycin uh, PO, either through the NG tube, or if they have alias, then you, you can consider using uh, a rectal enema with uh, with vancomycin, and uh, with that you can, you should all, you should also use uh, IV metronidazole. For the first recurrence, if the patient um, had uh, flagell for the uh, 
for the uh, first uh, episode, then uh, for the first recurrence, you have to use vancomycin for 10 days. But if they've used vancomycin before, you could use fidoxomycin. And uh, uh, if you if you use vancomycin, fidoxomycin in the first episode, then you, you have to do like a prolonged course of vancomycin. Or uh, you could do like a, a pulsed vancomycin regimen as well instead of a prolonged course. Um, and if it's a second or a subsequent uh, uh, recurrence, then you, know, you again use a vancomycin in like a tapered or a pulsed uh, regimen. Or uh, you could do like vancomycin uh, for 10 days and then uh, rifaximin for like another next 20 days. So that's like an alternative thing that you could use. And uh, fecal microbiota uh, transplantation, fecal transplantation is it actually has uh, very high uh, recommendation and strong evidence to it. So other like surgical management, if they're like severely ill, then you could do a subtotal colectomy with uh, the preservation of the rectum. If you cannot do that, then you could do like a diverting uh, loop ileostomy with the colonic lavage, and you could do like vancomycin flushes, anti-grade vancomycin flushes. So that's like an alternative if the subtotal colectomy cannot 